Welcome everybody to the Utah Stories show. So here at Utah Stories, we made a huge decision today. So for the last 10 and a half years, we've come out with a weekly issue of Utah Stories. Behind me is the hidden, hidden Utah issue. Over here is our Wild West issue. This was our beer issue. Every single month for 10 and a half years, we've come out with a magazine. We will not be coming out with an April issue of the magazine, at least in our regular format where we distribute to 700 locations, 26,000 copies all over the state of Utah. Because the places we distribute to are restaurants, bars, coffee shops, rec centers, hotels, libraries, all except for hotels are closed. And we don't know how long they're going to be closed for. So we we decided um, we could not do a service to our advertisers just through our outdoor distribution and through the hope of coming up with a distribution strategy right now. Our strategy is to get into grocery stores and do do more outdoor distribution racks. But until that strategy is in place, there is no Utah Stories magazine for April. Very sad. Um, but it's also everything that is is uh, looks like a setback. It looks like a gi giant challenge or that looks sad. There's always a silver lining. And the silver lining is we are beefing up our online content and presence. We have our podcast, digital newsletters, our videos. We will be offering more content online in April than we ever have before. By far, we're going to be doing lots of videos. Um, it would normally be our health and wellness issue. We are still focusing on health and wellness through the whole month of April. We're calling it our Coronavirus Survival Toolkit. We're going to give you all the tools you need to survive in Utah, to thrive in Utah in April and into May uh, by providing you awesome content about backyard gardening, how to become more self-reliant if self-supply chains are affected, and just a little hint, hoarding toilet paper is not the solution. Um, how to handle your kids and occupy them in better ways from home, how to eat better, some basic nutrition advice, um, how to forage mushrooms in the forest in case you need to bug out and live in a forest, kind of like Rambo. Um, we have a lot of fun plans for what we want to provide, and I'm really excited about it. But you'll need to subscribe to our digital newsletter to have access to it. It's a free subscription to our digital newsletter. Um, but you won't know the content is coming out unless you subscribe. Go to utahstories.com, subscribe to that for sure. So for today's program, we are taking a look at our local restaurants and bars. I strongly believe restaurants and bars make up the uh, social fabric of our communities. And really without them, Salt Lake City, a sugar house, a lot of the amazing communities all over Utah would not be cool places to hang out if it weren't for the bars and restaurants. So we're looking at how they're going to get through this coronavirus problem and what they're doing to deal with it. And specifically, I'm talking to a woman who owns one of the biggest bars in downtown Salt Lake City. Her name is Bridget Gordon. She owns the Green Pig Pub. I've known Bridget now for about 10 years. I started when she started her bar, and she's been a longtime advertiser, supporter of Utah Stories. I talked to her all about what she is doing with her 90 employees, how she's going to handle the government relief program, everything a restaurant owner should know, bar owner should know in Utah um, to be able to survive what's happening. And so, and I'll be talking to bar and restaurant owners throughout the month, playing clips from those interviews. You'll be able to watch the whole or listen to the whole interviews, but I'll be playing clips on the podcast and throughout the month. And uh, so it's all about coronavirus survival all throughout the month of April. Um, which I will give you a little more detail about in just a minute. Before I do, I want to tell you about one of our sponsors, which is Canyon Meadows Grass-Fed Beef. So they're located in eastern Utah in the beautiful Altamont pastures. There are some extremely happy cows who I've personally met. These cows are so happy because their entire lives they are fed on pastures. Their ranchers are practicing regenerative agriculture. And if you don't know the difference between factory farm beef and pasture-raised beef, you really need to taste the difference. Go give Canyon Meadows a try. Visit their website. Choose your own package of steaks, ribs, ground beef, and roasts. I personally have been eating and enjoying Canyon Meadows 
uh, for our backyard barbecues for three years now, and I am never going back to factory farm beef. I'm constantly blown away by how tender and delicious their meat is. So go visit their site right now at cmrbeef.com. Uh, truly amazing. Good for the good for your health. Good for your environment. Good for the land. This show is also brought to you by Yoshi's and their new location in downtown Salt Lake City. Yoshi's has seriously awesome, fast, casual sushi. They've been legendary in the food truck scene. And their new location in Murray for years, now they have a great new location in right in the heart in downtown, and they have reopened for curbside delivery. So go check them out. Uh, Google Yoshi's and find their menu online. Do curbside delivery. You will love it. All right. So what I'm realizing from the aftermath of my last video and podcast is that there is a sentiment among certain people who believe we all need to accept everything the government says and everything the media tells us at face value all the time. Um, they, I had somebody tell me what I reported on last time, that we should examine the numbers, really strive and work hard to find truth on our own. Don't believe anybody, but really look at the numbers to tell you the truth. And, and somebody said that was irresponsible. Uh, I don't think that is irresponsible. I think we need to be questioning what our decision makers are saying and or doing and what the media is telling us. Even if it's not politically correct and even if you might feel un, a little bit uncomfortable saying it. So um, I, I mentioned last time how Fox News really is saying, you know, Sean Hannity in particular, we're going to get through this easily. There's just going to be a solution. There's a solution right now. We just need to get it out there. Uh, no problem. We're, we're all on top of this. And then CNN anchors, MSNBC anchors say the doom and gloom is here. It's going to stay. It's going to be awful. We're going to have massive death. And there, there is a very hard, difficult, um, difficulty in an independent minded person to really understand what the truth is. If you just totally want to believe everything the left is telling you, you're in a great place because you just watch MSNBC and CNN and you think you know the truth. Vice versa, if, if you're a right winger, just watch Fox News. You'll just feel like you know exactly what's going on. But the truth is always somewhere in the middle. And the problem is I can't accept either one of their truths because we don't know. They don't want to say that they don't know because they're supposed to know. They're news people. But we don't know because we don't know how many people have coronavirus or have had it. We don't know what the numerator is. It's a numerator problem, meaning you can't divide one number by another number if you don't know what the the uh, top number is. So um, we don't have accurate numbers as to the death rate. We The numbers will become clear as more people are being tested. Here in Utah now, we are able to test around 2,000 people per day. So the case number is going up and up and up in Utah. And to say that, oh, we're so worse off than, say, Nevada or um, Wyoming or Idaho because our case number is way higher, we don't actually know that because people in these other states might be having it, but they don't know because they're not being tested. So now that we're finally getting a lot of testing capacity, we're actually going to start getting clear numbers as to how many people are actually dying of this thing. And there are, they're still saying if you're, if you're asymptomatic but you think you have it, don't be tested. So I, I just am, am, am it's like we're waiting till the test capacity can basically extend to maybe five to 10,000 people a day before we get accurate numbers. But we now have 1,067 cases in Utah, and six people have died. Um, I need to get the specific data, but I believe every single person who has died has been over the age of 60 and has pre-existing conditions. And so this is, at least in Utah, um, looking about twice as serious as the, uh, the mortality rate of a really bad flu. The mortality rate of a really bad flu pandemic would be 0.1 to 0.3%. The mortality rate in Utah of coronavirus, at least with the people who have been tested, is 0.6%. 
So it's still less than 1% mortality and um, still less than 100 confirmed cases out of 100 confirmed cases, less than one person uh, has died. So keep your eye on this number because this is the number that will justify what the government is doing. And please watch my previous episode if you didn't catch it. What the government could be doing is just devaluing our currency in order to stave off massive, massive, massive unemployment and social unrest. And if we just kick the can down the road, essentially, in devaluing our currency in order to keep people on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum happy um, and fed, you know, that is one thing to do. But does that outweigh when you do a cost to benefit analysis, is that going to outweigh just simply protecting our most vulnerable people in the community and doing massive testing and reopening everything in our economy so that we can be generating money again, especially for those people who are healthy, strong, working in places like restaurants, who where these places need to open again. They need to start generating cash again. They need to start paying people again. It's just like the government can't do that job. It's just It's just close to impossible. Because what we really know here is that Rudy Gobert, Donovan Mitchell on the on the Jazz, they both got it. They both recovered. Our Senator Ben McAdams, they he had it. He's recovered. Um, Ninety nine percent of people get over it, and um, so I just think that if we're doing a six trillion dollar government bailout for people and corporations. Let's look at that math a little bit closely, a little bit closer. Six trillion dollars divided by 340 million Americans. Say, best case scenario, you get a three thousand dollar check, and everybody watching this show, I'm sure, could use a three thousand dollar check right now. But 340 million Americans on the hook to pay back. Six trillion dollars that puts every American on the hook for 17.8 thousand dollars, 18 grand. You got to pay back for that three thousand dollar check. Every single man, woman, and child in America needs to pay back 18 thousand dollars. So that's not just you, it's you, your wife, and all your kids got to pay back 18 thousand dollars to get that check for three thousand dollars from the government if it's a six trillion dollar bailout. So, why isn't the number? of your check higher because most of that money, for example, $50 $50 billion is going to bail out the airline industry. Most of that money is going to big corporations. And the Small Business Administration has opened up uh, $350 billion. That's great. But look at the fraction of that of the $6 trillion. It's not even, uh, I believe that's one, uh, less than one, 16th of the bailout is going to small businesses. Like if they said, oh, we're doing a $6 trillion bailout and five of it's going to small businesses, I'd be like, oh, great. That sounds awesome. But $350 billion, that's not even half a, half a trillion, not even half of $1 trillion is going to small businesses right now. Um, and I just think small businesses make out... 68% of the jobs in this country. So just start to look and examine in these numbers, and they don't really make sense. And, um, you know, I, I, I need to delve deeper into the numbers to gain a greater understanding of everything. But uh, I, I think that what the Small Business um, Administration is going to be getting on um, these SBA loans, every single small business should be applying to those right now. Absolutely, because it's basically just a way to route the money that, that that is going to be funneled to Americans who are on payrolls through your business to keep them working for you. So if you've got employees, if you've got contractors, um, you need to go check out the link on from our website or just go Google it. The Paycheck Protection Program, um, you'll get a loan at 0.5% interest and you'll have five years to pay it back. But if you prove that you are that your employees stay on the payroll after 
uh, you reopen, then you don't actually have to pay the money back. So now I'm going to be talking to Bridget Gordon, who's the owner of the Green Pig Pub, to see how she's navigating the loan program and how she intends to use them. So what I noticed is it's really sad. All the bars in downtown Salt Lake City are not offering curbside delivery. They just decided to close. The bars are the best food in downtown Salt Lake City. If you are familiar, we have these places, Green Pig Pub, um, Z Twist, Zest, uh, Bodega, White Horse, Whiskey Street. They're all just incredible food, especially the value. Like for 12 bucks, you can get this amazing gourmet burger. Um, none of them are open. So it's like we can't support them. And my question for Bridget, why did they all decide to close? Here's her answer. Um, because of the expense. Um, most bars are not related to takeout food as with sandwich shops or pizzerias um, in fast food. So I'm pretty sure that's why we're not doing it. And the expense of paying our kitchen staff, which we pay our kitchen staff a lot more than most fast food places, um, just didn't make sense. So what she told me is like they pay their top chef over a hundred grand a year. A hundred grand a year is not uncommon for, you know, a really amazing uh, gastro pub. So obviously you had to bring in tons of revenue to cover that expense. So they had to let those people um, get laid off. So my next question for her is when and how did she find out she had to close her restaurant? Like right before St. Patty's Day, one of their biggest days of the year, she found out. So I asked her how and why, how and when did she find this out? Um, so they passed that on March 16th, which was Monday. The next day was St. Patty's Day and we were all closed. Yeah, and terrible so the earthquake, for you, yeah, right? yeah, the earthquake was on Wednesday the 18th, which happened to be my birthday. So I just thought I'd shake up Salt Lake for that, you know. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah, and it couldn't be worse timing, isn't your St. Patty's Day celebration one of your biggest days? Yeah, next to uh, Pride, it is my biggest day of the year. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of income to lose. We had, um, of course, stocked up and had our food orders in with all our vendors and our food got delivered on Monday and then I ended up giving it all away to my employees on Tuesday. So that was, you know, I don't know, close to $20,000 worth of product that I had to give away. Yeah, so if you go back to two videos ago, I visited downtown Salt Lake City a few hours after the earthquake just to see what was going on. I went past the Green Pig Pub, saw it was totally closed down with a sign on the door. Um, really sad to see just she, she had to completely close down a couple days before the earthquake. I guess that's maybe good. It, it's a lot of build, buildings suffered for that 5.7, um, 5 5.9 earthquake. Can't remember which one, but it was it was like crumbling bricks all over the sidewalk. If you get a chance to watch that video on our channel. So our next question was what happened? She has 90 employees between two bars. What's happened to all her employees? So we have laid them all off. Um, most of them have applied for unemployment. Um, we're waiting for this TPP to go through, um, which I will be applying for to um, pay most of my staff. Um, not all of the staff is going to get paid just because of, you know, a lot of them we have only been working with us a couple of weeks because we were amping up for spring and summertime, um, you know, because we need more employees at that time. Um, so it'll be basically for my core employees that work with us that have been with me for over a year. And so how, the, how this loan works out is that if I um, pay all of the employees during this time, they have to all come back to work for me um, when, the, when this period is over with. Well, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of them aren't going to be coming back because they'll be, you know, hopefully finding other jobs and keeping themselves alive during this time. Um, mm. So with this loan, you know, if I <clears throat> paid everybody, then everybody has to come back to work with us. If they don't, then I have to repay that money back to the um, SBA. So if you understand that, the government is giving out 0.5% interest rate loans to small businesses 
those loans need to be repaid if the employee decides not to return. Those That's like you have no control as a small business owner at all if that person wants to come back. And of course, any person who's laid off right now, they're going to say the same thing. Of course, I'm going to come back if I don't find another job. But if these people are out of work for three months, of course, they're going to try to find other jobs. So that's a huge burden to place on small business owners with those kinds of strings attached. And I mean, and it's sort of like an insincere uh $550 billion they're giving to small businesses because they're not giving it to them. They're giving it to a, to them with a very low interest rate. But if all these people decide not to come back to work and find or find other jobs or move to Cuba, whatever, then they're out. These business owners are have to pay all this money back. So really tough position that puts all restaurant owners in. Um, so they basically just have to see who's going to be loyal to them and really get a gut instinct of how loyal they're going to be and uh, in really tough position. So the last question I had for uh, Bridget is um, what's going to happen to downtown bars and restaurants in Salt Lake after this is over? Um, I, I believe that some aren't going to make it. I, I My heart breaks over that because... I know what it's like to put everything in to build something, you know. Um, uh, I wish everybody the best of luck when we're re reopening, when we get to do this, but I know that some of them are not coming back. And um, and that's, that's sad because, I mean, who can go without being in business for three months? Yeah, so I know a few bars and newer bars in downtown – um, restaurants that it, you, they probably haven't stockpiled savings aside. So it's sad. There's going to be, there's going to be quite a few that won't make it. Um, so my final question was when does she believe this state will lift the order of bars and restaurants being closed? When does she think they're going to be reopening? I truly believe we're not going to be opening the restaurants and bars back up until probably the end of June to the 1st of July. Wow, you think so? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope I'm I wrong. Think... I really hope I'm wrong. I do. But yeah, with the way too. things are going, you know, and everything's closed down until the 30th of this month, well, you know, in another couple of weeks, get, they can do another reevaluation and say, okay, now we're going to May 15th. Okay, now we're going to May 30th. Now we're going mm -hmm. to June 15th. And, you know, this isn't going to go away overnight. This is going to take time. We haven't even peaked yet with this mm -hmm. virus. So there's, there's still quite a bit of time, you know, um, other places have gotten into a false sense of security and, you know, they saw a small decline. Well, then it's spiked right after that. And I just, I think we're going to, you know, experience the same thing. And, you know, the main thing is to squash this bug, to squash it. And the only way to do that is to stay away from each other and, um, keep staying on the same path. I mean, it saddens me to say this, but. You know, for us to survive in the long run, this is what has to be done right now. So that's where we stand. Um, she doesn't believe it will open till the end of June, beginning of July. That would be that would be tragic, honestly. Um, and um, but I think we all have to have to plan for the worst, hope for the best. I think that is the right attitude to have. Um, if you're if you're out of a job if you've been laid off from a restaurant, from whatever, try to find work. Um, I was, I was laid off. I got a severance package. I was laid off, uh, right after the beginning of the, um, dot com bubble. And, um, I, I just took odd jobs, anything I could do. I, I built, um, shelves in my, uh, my brother's storage container. I had took jobs painting for my dad, um, and I had worked this amazing career as a graphic um, designer. Um, uh, I, I was an art director, but I got laid off. And so you just do what you can to make some money. Um, don't stay idle. Just, you know, realize probably she's right. End of June. And then if things get better, then awesome. But don't count on the federal government, you know, giving you money, free money indefinitely. 
go look for a job, go hope for the best. And um, as far as the small business goes, all the small business owners in Utah need to be applying for these loans. By default, the biggest corporations already have all of the support staff, the admin staff, the attorneys to get as much as they possibly can. This could end, actually end up being a huge windfall for the airline industry if they get $50 billion. Um, a lot of corporations are just getting paid to not operate. Unfortunately, small businesses always play by a different set of rules than big corporations. So small business owners need to go out and look at the best ways to navigate these loans, which will be our next episode of our podcast. We're going to be talking to Eddie Johansson from Yoshi's, and he'll be telling us all about that. All right. So let's segue now into our next story, um, which is about Alan Park. But before I get to that, I want to tell you about a couple of our awesome advertisers. Um, I want to tell you about the Carpet Barn. The Carpet Barn has been in South Salt Lake now for a few years. Before that, they were in West Valley for over 30 years. They provide amazing, high-quality, high-thread count carpet at rock-bottom discount prices. I finally had the opportunity to use the Carpet Barn to put carpet in my entire basement, and it's this rich, thick, plush carpet, super high-quality Um I paid for it way less than I paid for this cheap, crappy carpet I bought 10 years ago. And I, I just don't know why everybody does not go to the carpet barn to buy their carpet. Google them, check them out in South Salt Lake. Uh, tell them you found out about them by for, by listening to the Utah Stories show. That would be a great benefit. I love these guys. It's a small family-owned business. Their staff is, is really awesome to work with. Um, go check out the carpet barn. Um, also you need to go and think about your summer down the road, June, July, August, we're going to be through with this and everybody will know if they ever had it, the testing will be done. Book your next river rafting trip right now with Sherry Griffith river expeditions out of Moab. So Moab, of course, is if you watch this show or read the magazine, I just believe it's one of the greatest places on earth. There's two national parks, Canyonlands and Arches. They run most of the rivers that go down through around there. One of the best experiences I've ever had was uh, doing the Yampa with Sherry Griffith. They pay their guides pay such great attention to detail. They they craft these amazing gourmet meals. Well, every single meal you have down the river, and uh, they've got all these excellent trips. They've got Cataract Canyon, Labyrinth Canyon. Go visit them right now and book your next summer trip. Look forward to your summer because it's going to be great. And um, go visit GriffithExp.com or Google Sherry Griffith. That's S-H-E-R-I-G-R-I-F-F-I-T-H, River Expeditions, and go check them out. All right, so... The development I wanted to tell you about is Allen Park and how Allen Park has been saved. It's just this really cool story. Um, we reported on it in our February issue, and I'm going to show you some photos from that. Tyler's going to put those up on the screen. Um, Allen Park is this quirky little offshoot park. It was developed by a doctor named uh, Dr. Allen, and he set aside about 20 acres to make all of these really cool sculptures. He put in all these peacocks that would free range. If anybody knows the area, you can walk through, but then you'll get yelled at because the residents were really kind of grumpy and unfriendly. Last time we went there, um, we were there with our dogs. We had their dogs on leash. And they said, "Why we would never come to you, your house and walk through your backyard. You're walking through our backyard right now. And it was on a street and they were just mean people um, because I guess they were getting too much traffic. But these people weren't the owners. These were renters and the place was getting into disrepair. And so the owners had to sell Allen Park and they sold it to a developer. The developer was all set to make 40 um, townhouses there and build right over the top of it. 
and then we covered it, and it was really cool to see the the Tribune also covered it. It got all this like groundswell momentum to save Allen Park. Hobbitville was its nickname because there were all these uh, just awesome little sculptures and really cool structures there. And um, the city stepped forward due to the, the support by the community, and they, they're going to save Allen Park. And the greatest thing is I run past Allen Park every day because I go through Westminster Ravine with my dogs. And... Um, and then I, I I see the peacocks as I come up past West, Westminster. Now to run through Parley's Creek and the ravine all the way up past 1300 East is going to be amazing for my day. I'm so looking forward to it. And I'm sure everybody living in Sugar House will, is, is just going to greatly benefit from having that. Um, I just think one of the best places you can go and meditate is by is a riparian corridor, and we should be preserving our... We have so many canyons and streams running down from the mountains. We should be preserving these riparian corridors so that more people can enjoy them, go sit by a stream and meditate. I just think it's the very best way to, to recharge, rebalance, and, and to reconnect with nature. And so a, a big victory for and a great investment by Salt Lake City. I, I love small government, but I think this is an investment that's very worthwhile, especially with all this development happening right now. Um, to develop over such a gem would be, would be kind of tragic. So this, this, our coverage of this story went viral on utahstories.com. I suggest you go visit utahstories.com and look at it. So it's kind of cool that we had a small part to do, I think, with the saving of this by getting the word out. Um, this is what the best of grassroots local journalism can do. It can help preserve what is best in a community. But this does not happen if there's no local journalism, if nobody knows what's going on. And it's why I, I believe so strongly that our we have a big group, huge pool of writers and we basically use our advertising dollars to give them money. Um, a lot of free magazines, they don't pay anybody. We strongly believe in paying our writers and contributors, and which um, is a segue to what it is we're doing to, um, to basically boost our presence despite not having the magazine or the advertising dollars from the magazine this month. I really think that... Um, if you value this kind of coverage, if you see value in local journalism, we're, we've opened up our website for the first time to donations. And what I what I really want to do is um, is I want whoever wants to see our April issue come out. We have it done. We just can't afford to print it and distribute it. But if you would. I'm going to treat this kind of like a Kickstarter campaign this month. If we raise around $2,000, our printing, our printer is giving us, us an amazing deal. It's a local printer here in Salt Lake, Hudson Printing. If we can raise right around $2,000, we can print the magazine, um, but what we, we would not be able to distribute it until we have a distribution plan in place. And so we would mail you a copy if you want to contribute $5.00 to getting our next issue out. It's got amazing stories about, as we said, how you stay healthy and wealthy and wise and, and prosper, not just languor, uh, suffer and, and uh, languish during this time. And we are offering this content to anyone who will mail out a magazine to you if you if you send us or you want to contribute five dollars to our cause you can you contribute a dollar up to up to twenty dollars but we want to mail you a copy of the magazine for five and um yeah i'd love to get it out there so let's see if it happens if it does happen great if it doesn't we'll move on in may and and hopefully things will be looking better by then um, but I'm actually just thinking, you know, like everyone I'm sure feels at home right now, you just take everything day by day in stride. We don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next, but the best thing you can do is plan for the worst. This could stretch out to the end of June, which will mean we'll just be doing a lot of digital content and coming out with probably limited release issues. But hopefully, if you value local journalism, if you value the power it has in checking our leaders with 
truth and you getting the best and brightest and um and most important voices in our community presented to the people it can make a huge impact the voice of local utah has been utah stories mission for the last 12 years it will continue to be our mission and it's all really thanks to you all of you who are watching all of you who pick this magazine up every month um, obviously it it's a little freaky to not come out with a magazine first time in 10 and a half years but i'm sure everybody watching and everybody involved is going through things that are a little freaky on their own so i'm not too worried about it we'll get past it and uh, I look forward to uh, continuing to see you on this program. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.